Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, February 23rd, and we are picking up in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 2. Really, we'll pick up in about verse 23, but just as a recap, we were looking at the wonderful way that God had brought a companion into Adam's life, into Adam's life. We saw that God used Adam's own body to create Eve. That would be a forever reminder of their oneness, that they are echad, they are one. Even though Adam would see differences, we talked about how that was like colors. Red and blue are different. How is red better than blue? It's not only it's better at being red and blue is better at being blue, uh -huh. but there isn't a better, you know, that one is superior and one is inferior. The same way we see with water, hot and cold, value in both. It's, it's still a oneness and an equality that Eve, as the Jewish proverb says, Eve was taken from Adam's side not to be his head, rule over him, or to be ruled by him, not from his feet to be trampled on, but out of his side to be equal with him, to be a companion, under his arm to be protected by him, and near his heart to be loved by him. This was God's intention, the two becoming that one, and uh, the woman created to enable Adam to do what God commanded Adam to do, in that way they are a team. And we see very definitely that we today, with our sin natures in here, have many differences in here, but this is the way God had intended. So he fashioned, he made, Chava, that, I'll tell you what that means, but you, you call her Eve, I'll tell you when we get to that very shortly. He, in the Hebrew, builded her, and even though that's not good English, I love it because you see a, in your mind building right away, you see a foundation, you see walls, you see a roof, you see something coming together to form one something, and that is what... Um, I think God was intending, even because he uses it as a picture of us being his body. Now, he is our head. We are under him. We are not his equals. We know that. But he brings us into that oneness with him, and we even become joint heirs with him. We'll talk more about that as we go on also. But when the scriptures tell us in verse 22, and we talk, talked about it last week, that God brought her, <coughs> excuse me, brought her to Adam. Your scripture may say to the man, but it's to Adam, that that's a picture, future, of when God, after he's finished forming the body, the, the bride of Messiah, the bride of Christ, he will bring her to him. We are raptured to meet the Lord in the air, our bridegroom. It's the bride coming to, to meet the bride, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, because even when he comes back down to earth to set up his rule on this earth, we come with him. That's Revelation 19. The catching up is 1 Thessalonians 4, and we saw 2 Corinthians 11 also. We looked at all those references last week. So moving into verse 12, uh, sorry, verse 23. I don't know where I am. <laughs> verse 23, we have um, the man, or we have Adam, said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Okay, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Eve had the same physical flesh, the same physical life as Adam. The spirit was directly given to her by God. We read that in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27 that he made them in his image. And we know he breathed in and Adam became a living being. He obviously breathed into Eve to make her a living being. It was not Adam that brought her to life, it was God. So the image of God, directly created by God, was given to both man and woman, and this made each one capable of personal fellowship with God, because they're each their own living soul with that breath from God in them. When it says um, she shall be called woman, it's not, whoa, man, <laughs> that we talked about last week, but it is Hebrew, man is ish, and woman is isha. I think, again, the idea being she came out of man, that, that she is the same. You know, so the name was as close as it could be also. Because notice how verse 24 talks about the two of them. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother 
and be joined to his wife. Now you may have, if you got King James, the, the word before was cleaved. Cleave means to join together, is to hold fast, is to cling to, is to stick like glue. And you could call this monster glue or super glue or whatever you want to call it. It shouldn't weaken, it should never give its way. Where are we? First Gorilla glue. Oh, Gorilla Glue. Yes, Gorilla Glue. Good. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the idea behind this. The nature of marriage is seen in this. Now, at this point, even though we know Eve has been created, we don't have parents for Adam and Eve. We have God the Father, in essence, but we don't have parents for this next part when we when we read well it was in that phrase that that he shall leave father and his mother this was probably um i want to say it the right way added in remember adam's writing notes and they're going to be passed down <coughs> it was probably what was added back into this time nothing wrong with that because they're writing by inspiration of the holy spirit but by the time that's being compiled you have children. You have children that will leave their parents and come together in a marriage. But at this point, Adam wouldn't know what he's talking about. So he either wrote it without any understanding of it, or more likely it was a, um, a, not an afterthought. I can't say that. But it was an added part to the meaning as time moved on. The record here is to emphasize God's plan for marriage, the oneness of the man and the woman, and that they were to come together, and they were to propagate. There, there's this idea that sex is dirty, and having children and all this comes because of the fall. And I've got to get us out of that mindset, because before we even had the fall, God told Adam and Eve to fill the face of the earth. He told them to propagate. He told them to have children, and in his pure form, there's nothing dirty about it. It's beautiful. It's a picture even of that oneness coming together as one that nothing else I think on earth can really touch that picture. But see very clearly God had planned marriage and procreation before the fall. Not because of the fall, not after it, it was before. So with that in mind, they, they shall become one flesh. They're to come together to serve their creator in unity and in singleness of heart. Like the two moving in such sync, they're looked at as one. Our Hebrew word here is echad. The word that I've given you before is spelled in English E-C-H-A-D. I should have thought to put the whiteboard up, but we'll go without it. If you need a better explanation later, just let me know. But remember, echad is that word in Hebrew that means a divided one. It doesn't mean that they are divided, but it's one that can be divided. It's one that is like the hand. The hand is a chot. It's one hand, but there's five digits, and there's the, the main part, the palm of the hand also. It would be like the tabernacle. The tabernacle had the holy of holies. It had the holy place. It had the menorah. It had the altar. You know, it had many parts, but it's called the <coughs> tabernacle, one tabernacle, one unit. You would call a troop of soldiers a chot. They're obviously individuals, but they move as one. They're in sync as one. And it's definitely the word God uses for himself, as I've brought out to you before. Davarim, Deuteronomy 6.4, our most infamous prayer, our Shema, um, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is teaching us that God in some way can be divided. We know that's in the triunity, the God the Father, the God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that we see and in our mind we, we what decompartmentalize, we make them separate, and yet at the same time they are one. That's why that picture, the, the sheen, the shin, the letter that looks like our W with the base at the bottom is such a perfect example of God himself. Three branches that are equal, all tied together at that one base. The great mystery for us to fully understand because there's nothing on earth that can make us really totally understand. The closest we get are things like you can be a father, a son, and a husband all at the same time. You're one person in three different capacities, but yet you're one. Things like that give us that idea, that insight, 
here we're being told that we are echad as husband and wife. It's going to be seen that, that as the body of Messiah, the body of Christ, we are echad, we are one. We're going to see that, that in some way that it even goes beyond we are exalted to a high position in Messiah, in Christ, because we're told that we are to be seated with him in the heavenlies. Look with me real quickly to understand what I'm saying. Go to, whoops, I don't want to do that one because if I do, okay, come on, tablet. Well, we'll ignore, we'll ignore that one. Okay, sorry. I, my tablet's doing what it wants to do, not what I want it to do. Let me see. There we go. Okay, I lost it. <laughs> okay, my apologies. Here we go. I think I got it back. Okay, we're going to Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 6. Ephesians 2 and verse 6. And I'm going to see if I can, yeah, it's not, it is slow today. Wow, that's even yeah, worse than upstairs, slow. and I thought that was bad. Okay. And raised us up with him, with Yeshua, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Messiah Yeshua, in Christ Jesus. Okay, that's telling us that we are going to be lifted up into the heavenly places with our Lord. We are going to be joint heirs with the Lord. Look at Romans 8 and verse 17. Romans 8 and verse 17. In that jointness, being lifted up in that way, then we see, and if children, and we are children of, the, of God when we've asked Yeshua Jesus into our heart personally, God doesn't have grandchildren, and you can't create somebody else's life. Each one has to individually come when they have. They have the Spirit within them. Uh, verse 16 telling us that the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, heirs also, Heirs of God, fellow heirs with Messiah. If we suffer with him, we'll also be glorified with him. In some way, we come into that power and dominion and authority that is the Lord's. I'm not saying we are equal to the Lord. We never would be. But we're brought into that. We have that power to work through us. We have the ability to <clears throat> come against anything that this world throws at us. When the Lord said he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. What could be more than the gates of hell coming at you? That's opening the gate and letting all hell out at you, which means Satan and everything he can throw at you. You're greater. You're more powerful. You're stronger. You have authority in Yeshua Jesus, in his name, by his power to thwart anything that comes at you. At this point in time here on this earth, we see ourselves in the position of bond slaves to our Lord. We, a bond slave is one who's chosen to be that, that slave to the Lord. Um, when there's a time when a slave may have the opportunity to go free, and they can choose not to go free, but to remain in their master's house and take care of whatever business for their master. That's like what a bond slave is. So we at this point are bond slaves. We are the Lord's servants to serve him in the capacity he gives us to do here on this earth. But in eternity, we're going to be raised up higher than that to be ruling and reigning with the Lord. That's for those who, who prove themselves faithful, though. If you're not faithful to the Lord, don't expect him to put you in charge of something, because why would he any more than why would you put a child in charge of something who's shown themselves to not be responsible and not be in, in sync with you? So I think you get the idea. I just want you to see your oneness in the Lord. The power that gives you, the victory that that gives you, the position that that gives you. I stand in awe. <laughs> he picked me. <laughs> he chose <clears throat> this thing. <laughs> wow, what do you see, God? Because all I see is, is a mess. But he sees a message. And when we're in a test, he can turn it to a testimony. I love to change those phrases around by the power of the Lord. So let that encourage you and strengthen you wherever you are at today going back into that's my problem we're not going back into our um scripture sorry i'm shaking my head at my tablet not at what i'm saying i'm <coughs> um, going back to genesis so is what i'm trying to get us back to uh there are those modern day critics that want to say genesis 1 and genesis 2 are contradicting each other that they're telling us two different things um the ones who say that say that adam and eve are allegorical. 
they're very often your evolutionists, those who believe that, that man came about through all the myriad of changes that took place. But Yeshua Jesus gives no room for that. Not only do we know every word of the scriptures is inerrant, and that when God names people, they are real people. We see that even when the Lord spoke in parables, if it was a parable, he didn't use real names. If it was a real story of something that happened, he used the very names, uh, or the, the name. I'll show you that um, in just a little bit, I think, in the future. If not, it's Luke 16 that gives you that exception. Uh, but anyway, Yeshua Jesus confirms their historicity. He shows that they were not an allegory. He shows that both chapters, he gives his carte blanche approval to what's written in both chapters because he uses parts of both to uh, make his point. Let me, what's easier, let me just take you to Matthew 19 real quickly. And I think that will make my point more understandable. Matthew 19, we're going to look at verses 3 through 6. In Matthew, Mattathiah, we've got Jewish Matthew recording the footsteps of Yeshua Jesus in his earthly life on this earth. And Yeshua Jesus is speaking, as verse 3 says, some of the par par parashim, Pharisees in your English, came to Yeshua Jesus testing him. They were always against him. They didn't like him. He was a threat to them. They were testing him and they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Because this is what the, the Jewish religious leaders were teaching, that a woman could be divorced basically over nothing. If she burned his toast, he could divorce her. You know? And this, of course, is not what God had intended. The word divorce is not in God's vocabulary. That's man's. That's not God's. The verse 4 says, He answered and he said to them, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning, that takes us right back to where we are, doesn't it, to Genesis, he made them male and female. Okay, that's what we've just been studying. And verse 5 said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now doesn't that sound exactly like chapter 2? Verse 1 told us he made them male and female. Verse 2 tells, uh, chapter 2, I'm sorry, tells us that they're, they're to, uh, the man's to leave, like, leave his father and mother and be joined as one. That says the Lord's quoting from chapter 1 and he's quoting from chapter 2. So obviously he's not saying that they're disagreeing with each other. We know chapter 2 is filling in some of our blanks. It's giving us more of the colorful picture. But they come together and the Lord is giving his approval on both of what these scriptures said. That there is no issue over any differences. He quoted Genesis 1.27 with, with the uh, making male and female. And he quoted chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, where we are right now. And I didn't bring out earlier also Ephesians 5, starting with about verse 25, I think it is, goes through 31, tells how um, it's a picture of the body of Messiah, the church, it brought into the picture in marriage there also. Again, we're going to touch on that in a little bit, so I won't go into it right now. But the church is the body and, uh, and Messiah being the head, but it, it, it's looked at like a marriage. Um, and you'll see that when we go through that or go through the verses on your own. <clears throat> Excuse me. Staying on point right now, though, we'll go back to verse 25 now in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 2. We've got the two be become one flesh. And now it tells us in verse 25, And the man and his wife were both naked, and we're not ashamed, <clears throat> okay? Because God had created them. They felt perfectly natural with each other. There was no reason for shame. Uh, it is also believed, and I think that, that it, I think it's on the right track. This isn't something that we can say dogmatically, <clears throat> but evidence seems to give us the indication that there may have been some sort of, and I'm going to call it a glory light, some sort of a glow around Adam and Eve. I'll explain why it does seem to be quite possible as we go on in the next few verses. Just let that thought be in your mind for right now, that there was some sort of 
of light that was emanating from them, again, being created in the image of the Lord. That's one hint that will go on. They were unashamed since they were innocent. There was no consciousness of sin. Remember, they have not eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So they have no knowledge of sin, of evil. They don't have moral guilt. They, have, they, they feel no shame. They don't know what shame is. Therefore, there was no shame in their nakedness. And again, if they were covered with this glory light, we have to think of it in that term more than how we break it down today because we, we cannot think what it was like before. We have nothing to understand that experientially. We only know what it's like after. After the, the sin came in and we do understand moral uh, consciousness and we do understand sin and evil. But on this side, it was all glory. Wow. <laughs> all glory. Okay, now... Um, if they were covered with that glory light before they sinned, it could be what helps us understand, and again, we'll talk about it when we get there, but chapter 3 and verse 7 tells us that they knew they were naked. That it sounds like something's changed that gave them that awareness. Okay, hold on to that thought. We'll get to 3, 7, hopefully today, and we'll pick that back up later. But the physical was to teach the spiritual lesson. And we can definitely take it into the spiritual. We know we need to be clothed in his robe of righteousness. That's an absolute. Revelation, um, in fact, go with me. We'll go to several verses in Revelation. We'll start with chapter 3. Revelation 3, and we're going to look at verse 18. Revelation 3, 18, we have there. I advise you, it's um, the Lord speaking to the church of Laodicea. This is the lukewarm church, hot and cold and in and out and off and on, and probably many of them in that not even saved. Don't be surprised that not everybody sitting on the pew next to you in church is saved. A lot of people think they're saved, they're Christian, because they were born in a Christian nation. They go to church. That makes them a Christian. Well, I'm going to ask you, if you were born in the garage, does that make you a car? <laughs> no. Yes? When I was in Texas, she was a Sunday school teacher, her dad was a deacon, that made her a Christian. Just, okay. So some say holding positions like Sunday school teacher, deacon, whatever. These are titles, <laughs> these are names. Yep. That's not telling what's in the heart. So um, keeping that in mind, though, here, um, the Lord is telling them in verse 18, I advised you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And then it goes on. This was a church that thought they were great. They thought they could see. They thought they were close. They thought they were wealthy. And the Lord's calling them out saying, you're poor, you're naked, and you're in trouble. Okay, so we see that he's telling them, you need this robe of righteousness. Go to chapter 16, Revelation chapter 16. And in, in Revelation chapter 16, we want to look at verse 15. And there we read, Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes, so that he will not walk about naked, and men will not see his shame. Staying faithful to the Lord you're clothed in that righteousness of the Lord. Um, and that's speaking in the spiritual sense. Chapter 19, and this one will definitely bring it home for us. Chapter 19, we're going to look early at verses 7 and 8. And this, we, if you know Revelation, you know chapter 19. It, it's the coming of Messiah. He will come at the Battle of Armageddon, stopping the war, and getting rid of the, the false prophet, getting rid of the Antichrist, putting Satan in the pit to go into chapter 20, where Satan's put in the pit to go into the millennium. But this is just prior to his coming. Verse 11 has his coming. See, heaven open, behold a white horse, and he's coming. But verses 7 and 8 says, Let us rejoice, be glad, Give the glory to him, to the Lord, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Remember, he's our bridegroom. We are his bride. We've made ourselves ready because we have on 
the robe of righteousness. The bride is ready when she's got her bridal gown on and she's ready to come out. Well, that's where it is. Where did we get that gown? Where did we get that robe of righteousness? Verse 8, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So we are given it from the Lamb and we are given uh, because of the righteous acts. Now, Isaiah tells us all our righteousness is filthy rags. Have you ever seen a bride going down the aisle in filthy rags saying, I'm beautiful and I'm ready for my bride? No. We are clothed in his righteousness when we accept his free gift of salvation. That's our robe of righteousness. And then the actions that we do for the Lord in his power, by his name, for his glory, is part of our reward. Now, Here's my mom's commentary, and I put it that way because I want you to realize we don't have it in Scripture, but I, I know she's on the right thought. She said, in some way, maybe some people will be up there in heaven in a mini skirt because they didn't have much in the way of the acts that they did for the Lord. And others may have a long flowing gown, and we know we want the long flowing gown. So we want to do works for the Lord that enhance what we're wearing, but even the thief on the cross, who had no chance to do any works for the Lord, who's his, his moments before his death, even he would have the robe of righteousness because the initial robe of righteousness is our salvation. That when, when we are given salvation, we're given that robe. Okay, so that's why we see to be clothed in his righteousness can have this spiritual connotation. When we keep that in mind, then we can see and understand why nudity, as we see it, flaunting it out in the open, is really a denial of being a sinner. It's not it's saying there's nothing wrong with this, where we know that's more of a picture of sin. They thought they were clothed, and God called them out and said, you're naked. They thought they were doing for the Lord, but they weren't even in him and in his power. Yes. So does that mean, like, like the thief next to Christ, it's his faith? Yes. Not yes. necessarily Right, else? right, perfect. Dora, as the thief, then, is that like saying it's his faith that gave him that righteous robe? Yes, absolutely. Remember, Avraham was taken out, looked at the gospel and the stars, it was counted to him for righteousness. It is our faith that's counted for righteousness. It is our faith that saves us. By faith we are saved. By grace, God's grace, but by faith also, accepting, taking, believing in him for our salvation. That immediately clothes us in his righteousness, and then we get to go on and enhance. We get to earn crowns that we even might give them back to him. So, yes, but yeah, absolutely, you hit the nail on the head, and thank you for making sure I made that clear, because that, that's highly critical and highly important. But we will see a little bit more about the clothing and how it comes into play as we go into chapter 3, so let's go back to Genesis, and believe it or not, we're moving into chapter 3. See, we will eventually get through the book of Genesis. I just won't promise you whether we finish it together on earth or in heaven. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, chapter 3 and um, verse, well, before we start with verse 1, we've got God's created Adam and Eve innocent. He's given them dominion over the earth. There was nothing in man's nature to lead him to sin. We have that sin nature within us today. Adam and Eve did not have an inborn sin nature. They were made strictly in the image of God. He made them that way. They had to be persuaded to sin by an agent external to themselves. We all know who that is, and that's what we're going to come into now. But God allowed it because he wanted man with a free will. He didn't want man to be controlled as a puppet or a robot. He wanted him to have that free will, so he allowed man to be able to think and choose for himself. Satan designed it, well, let's put it this way. Basically, he lost his dominion, which was earth, and he says, I want it back. I'm going to go get it back. You give it to man. I'm going to usurp 
that position between you and man and get it back for myself. He wanted back his dominion over this planet. We've gone into it before, so I won't go into detail now, but look at Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 28, especially verses 12 through 17, talks about it. It's the time when you'll hear Satan saying, I will be like the Most High God. This is when we're told that he was created perfect until sin was found within him. And it tells how beautiful he was. But he lost that dominion when he was filled with pride and wanted the place of God for himself. He fell from the level that God had him at. He was probably the highest of the angels, the, the hierarchy. He probably was the highest of the highest. <clears throat> but he fell from that position. His, his dominion was judged, we believe. That's what gives us the what's called chaos in chapter 1, verse 2 of Genesis. The judgment come over his, his dominion, his what was earth. God recreates it, puts man in it, and gives man dominion over it. So what Satan had and lost, now man has. And Satan saying, uh-uh, I want it back. And I'm going to go after it with a vengeance, and that's what he does. That's our backdrop to bring us into chapter um, 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent, <coughs> boo hiss, <laughs> okay? Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Okay, Satan is, we're being told right up front, he is crafty. But I want you to see he comes in that craftiness. He doesn't come pitchfork, red devil, horns, tail, and who can I get? You know, the, let's do the dastardly deed. No, he comes disguised even as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. Where we read, and I'll be there in a moment, 2 Corinthians 11.14 tells us, No wonder, for even Satan, Satan, disguises himself as an angel of light. Right there it says it. He's, he can even do that. Um, and then it, it goes on and it says, So it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose uh, end will be according to their deeds. In other words, we may think they're righteous. They pulled the wool over our eyes. They look good. They look righteous. You think they've got it all? Well, God knows, and their end will be what they deserve. He's not going to get fooled. You can fool some of the people some of the time. Okay, you can fool all the people some of the time. Some of the, uh, I can't get it out. Anyway, you can't fool God. You can fool some people sometime, but not all the people all the time. Thank you. Thank you. And you can't fool God any of the time. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dora. I am tongue twisted today. So, this one who can describe himself, who is described as an angel of light, this is the one creeping into the garden now. So even though I booed and hissed, it's because I know what's coming and I know who he is, but not because of how he appeared. He's called the serpent because that's what we get in Scripture. Revelation 12. Go back there again with me. Revelation 12. We're going to see this is one of the names that's given to Satan, to Satan. Uh, we're going to see verse 9. Verse 9 has many of the names. And the great dragon was thrown down. The serpent of old. Here you go, going back to the beginning, back to Adam and Eve. The serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels thrown down with him. Hallelujah. Start of his going all the way down. Verses 14 and 15. In 14 we read, But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman, so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place, where she was nourished for a time, times, and half a time, from the presence of the serpent. Those of you who have been with me in Revelation know this is a picture of Israel. Israel is the one who brought forth the Messiah. It is the offspring. It is the, the Jewish people. It is the believers in Yeshua Jesus that he is going to go after with this, this vengeance. Verse 15, the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman 
that, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. That's language symbolic when we get into it, and this step is talking about an army that's going to come after those, the, those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's going to go after him like an army hunting down the enemy to destroy the enemy. He will be the one destroyed instead. But that's how he is described here is a serpent. This serpent pours out water like a river. It's the serpent that, that God's protecting Israel from and the believers from. It's the serpent up in verse 9 who's the dragon, the great dragon, who gets all these other names also, the devil and all that, that referred to as a serpent because that's how he first manifests himself in relation to mankind, is as the serpent. He comes into the garden as the serpent. When we look at Bud Midbar at Numbers chapter 21 verses 8 and 9, you can read that on your own later. That's uh, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness in their rebellion and their sin. The personification of it was in the picture of a serpent. God told Moshe to put the serpent on a stake to raise it up. It was made out of bronze. The people who would look up to it then would be saved otherwise they were being bitten by these venomous snakes that were, were bringing death it's a picture foreshadowing of the Lord taking our sin away from us the serpent is a picture of the evil of the sin being uh, a bronze stake that was lifted up bronze is judgment God judges that sin but it's also a picture of the crucifixion the execution stake that lifted Messiah up all who look up to him are saved. They're, they're brought out of death into life. So it's a picture of sin, sin being um, looked at, recognized, judged, and defeated um, by the form of the cross. That's what you're seeing there. So uh, serpent is very fitting for Satan. As we go back to chapter 3, he was cunning. He was crafty. I don't know which word you have. I have crafty in this translation, but you may have cunning. And that was his character. That is his character. Yes. What was that? Numbers what? Uh, numbers 21 and verses 8 and 9 are the serpent being lifted up. You read the verses a little earlier, you'll have them being bitten by the, the snakes. As a plague God had even sent against them because of their rebelliousness and their complaining. Watch complaining, folks. The Lord doesn't take it lightly. <laughs> okay? Um, and, and before we go back to, all the way back to Genesis, stop off in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And we will read, I think we were there a moment ago. I should have told us to save it. And my whole tablet just went away. Okay. Hmm. I have no idea what it's doing, but I think I've got it back. I may be picking up my original hard copy here shortly. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 11.3 is what I wanted you to focus on. I do have it. It says, But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and the purity of devotion to Messiah. It's simple. It's pure. Don't be deceived by his craftiness. But notice even Paul is referring to this crafty serpent as a historical figure, not mythical. This is an allegory. This isn't a story that's being told. This is an actual happening that it has been recorded for us. Yes, Maria. Okay. Oh, nope, she's oh, unmuted on her end, but I still can't hear her. Oh, check. Hold on one second, it's on our end, I think. Yeah, she's unmuted. That's so cute. Yeah. Come on. I'll try it. Try again, Maria. Unmute yourself again. It's remuted you. Okay. There we go. No, is that Genesis 21, 8, 9 that you were saying? Numbers. Numbers 21. Numbers. Numbers. Numbers, yes. Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9 have the serpent being lifted up in the wilderness, dealing with the rebelliousness and the, the sin of the people. Okay? Okay. 
All right, thanks. I think I should, I was trying to save time not going to it. I think I should have had us open it up. I think I lost us in between. So, and then I showed that in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, Paul is indicating there that, that, that this is who Satan is. It, this is an allegory here in Genesis. There's a lot of people that want to say Genesis is simply an allegory, a story to teach us. There are things we should learn from it. Everyone can give their opinion to it. No, that's not what's going on here. God is recording historical, accurately, factually for us to know and understand who our enemy is, where we are, what we need to do. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14. Shaul Paul is the one who is the author. He is speaking. We know that he's going to give Timothy many guidelines to, to live by. But in verse 14 he says, And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now we'll talk about that in a bit, what that means, why there is a difference being pointed out here. But right now the point I want to, you to see is... This crafty serpent is deceiving. And also, what was the other word I wanted? Um, maybe, maybe I've said it. Um, yeah, I think I've said it from 1 Timothy. He's deceiving. We know he's cunning. We know he's crafty. We know he's real. This is not just a story here. Satan sought and he still seeks to usurp God's plan, period. He wants his plan, he wants him on the throne, and he wants people worshiping him. So what does he do? He causes God's subjects to follow him and to worship him instead of God. That's his whole goal. That's what he was trying to do with Adam and Eve right there in the garden. This is his attempt through them to regain that dominion over the earth that he lost when he sinned, that I refer to in Hezekiel, Ezekiel 28. You can also read it in Isaiah chapter 14. I've been through both of those with you. That's why I won't do it right now because we'd lose a whole class time to it. But if you have any questions on it, let me know and I'll help you with it. Satan wants to regain what he lost. He wants to regain control by being the one that he's going to get man to listen to him, follow him, he even wants the worship of man. Isaiah that, 14? Yes. Verse. Uh, I think start with 12. I'll tell you real fast. Isaiah 14. Uh, and you, you have to understand the language there um, goes beyond, you know, there was a... a uh, well, here's the one that, that gives the description. I mean, Ezekiel goes beyond in the description also. Uh, oh, where do I want to start you? I think you can jump into verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven. Okay, we know when Satan fell from heaven. Oh, star of the morning, son of the dawn, you've been cut down. And then it goes on. In, and I think I gave this to Ezekiel earlier. Sorry, it's in the Isaiah 14 passage. I will ascend to heaven. I will raise up my throne. I will sit in the mount of the assembly of the north and on you know but instead you'll be brought down to the pit that's and they people are going to gaze at him and say this is what made man to stumble this thing that's how we're going to see him when he's in hell is that you know so that's isaiah 14 ezekiel 28 on the way back to uh, genesis i'll give you that um, then now i started in isaiah with about verse 12 i think you can jump in and see it ezekiel 28 um, there is the king of Tyre, but you see it goes beyond the king of Tyre, and uh, it has like what they call a near fulfillment and a greater fulfillment or a far fulfillment. And this tells us that he was in Eden in the garden of God in verse 13, but he starts talking about this lamentation in verse 12. So Ezekiel 28, starting with verse 12. That'll help me remember both of them. You start in verse 12. That makes it much easier. Uh, but look beyond the king of Tyre because it tells... The king wasn't this way. You had the sale perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. The precious stones were your covering. And it goes on and on. And then it says, until the day that sin was found in you. You were blameless the day you were created. 
but uh, um, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned in verse 16 so you've been cast down and it tells about his being destroyed from that um, and many changes that took place from outer to inner for our earth um, again, we talked about that, I believe, in Genesis 1, between 1, 1 and 1, 2, so I won't go into more of it now. But we're, we're seeing, again, his cunningness, his craftiness, his where he was. He was in this earth. It was his. Now Adam has it, and even he wants it back, so he's going to come. He's going to come in a way to trip them up. He's not coming as a friend. He's coming as an enemy, but he's going to disguise himself as he can, he can even make himself a, an angel of light. That behooves us to be on our toes, to not be fooled by him, to not be deceived as Eve was. But we'll talk about that as we go on also. So back at chapter 3, verse 1, The serpent was more crafty, more cunning than any beast of the field. Okay, um, the idea that we get from this, well, let me, let me read the next part. Did I, do I want to say it here? Okay, yeah, let me read the whole verse and then I'll make my point. More crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said to the women, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Okay, the serpent comes talking. The way that it said he is more crafty than all the animals, but the indication that we kind of get here, it sounds like all the animals had the ability to speak. We don't get the idea that he went, a talking serpent? <laughs> you, you don't get the idea that something so strange. It's not addressed if it were true, but I, I tend to think that there was ability for the others to speak. Either the animal spoke and he came as a serpent, the same way that the demons will enter a body today and use a body and speak through the body, um, it could be if the animals could speak in some way, communicate with Adam that has been lost, it would have been lost in the fall because we know they don't speak to us today. We say they speak. We know they talk, but they talk woof woof and meow meow and we can figure out what that means. You know, They, they can get their, their uh, voice across to us. We, we understand some, but not not like you and I do in, in this way. I'm laughing because my little grandniece was here yesterday and she's just young enough, you know, l learning words and you ask her, you know, what's the kitty say? Meow, meow. What's the doggy say? Woof, woof. She doesn't say they speak, but she knows their voices. But I'm saying maybe before the fall, there was more of a clear communication between the animals that when the serpent spoke, that was nothing to, to awaken Eve to, hey, there's something strange going on here. But then, but then again, they, never, they had never seen anything that couldn't talk. Or could, they never That's seen what I'm trying to say. Mean, so they right. didn't know. Right, right. So why would the others not be able to be in that communication? You know, I think a great loss happen to our animal world, our um, nature world, you know, everything paid the price for, for this because Adam's dominion was caught in the judgment, suffered the consequences. So yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Um, we also see from verse 14, if you sneak down to verse 14, that the serpent apparently at this time was upright not down on the ground because verse 14 when we're getting into the curse says the Lord God said to the serpent because you've done this cursed are you more than all the cattle more than every beast of the field on your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life now when we drop down to 14 I'll explain all the days of your life but my point here right now is it sounds very much like the serpent was upright the, the serpent was walking and talking and this wasn't unusual, but he does have a cunningness, a craftiness that we're going to see because look at his words. These are what are cunning. How is someone cunning? It is by their, their vocabulary, by the words that they use, by what they say. And he right away says, has God said, okay? Indeed, I have in mind, has God said? He's right there, and he, he uses the same method today. He's getting them to doubt God's word. That's what he does to us today. He'll 
try to trip us up to doubt what God has said. He was in this way getting them to doubt God's love. Because remember, all they've known is love from God. They don't know an evil, not from God, but an evil side to, to, they don't know Satan. They know God. They know that God made them. God loved them. God provided for them beautifully. The surroundings and all. I mean, that, that's all they've known. And here he's throwing doubt on that. Because we're going to see, he's going to basically say that, you know, to Eve, God's holding something back from you. That's... That's someone who loves you would not hold something back from you that's good for you. But that's what he's going to sow into her mind. So, his antic. Think negatively about God. He implies God's going to withhold something pleasurable, something good. God to them, to Adam and to Eve, is only, an, and for lack of better words, only a positive God. That's all they know is the positive side. They don't know anything negative. And he, this is where he's bringing, you know, the question in. Sin will always begin with questioning God's word or God's goodness or God's love. Right there. As soon as that's up in some form for question, you're in trouble. Uh, right there. Slippery slope. So, sow this doubt into the woman's mind. Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Well, the woman said, oops. No, she didn't say oops, but I mean the woman said. The woman talked back to the serpent. Mistake number one. This is the downfall to what will become her sin. Okay, the first step down for us is listening to Satan. I'm going to encourage you, don't even listen. She not only listened, but she's going to parlay in a conversation back and forth with Satan. You don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do that at all. I love the saying that says, if Satan knocks at your door, send Yeshua Jesus to answer. Don't even answer the door. Send him to answer. But immediately, had she understood what she should have done and what we can't understand because we're on this side knowing the difference, is she should have said, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to enter a conversation with you. I'm not going to give you the time of day. Be gone, and as the Greek says, and keep on going. Okay, that's what she should have done. She should have refused to listen. The next step down is tampering with the Word of God. And this is, again, what Satan's going to do. He's going to tamper with it in a way to bring her into doubt, into confusion. He, he's going to play with her. And because she's talking back and forth with him, she's playing into his game. So we read that the woman said, and I've lost my place. There we go. The woman said to the serpent, from the, whoops, sorry, my tablet and I aren't getting along. Um, there we are. From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Now, our understanding as far as we know, we don't know that God said you can't even touch it or you'll die. That is adding in to God's words. Okay, go back to chapter 2 and verse 17, where they're being given that commandment from God, and he says, But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat from it you will surely die. Okay, so there's a couple different ways to look at it. I can't be dogmatic and say, I know it, I got it all right, I was there. <laughs> I wasn't, and neither were you. So we were reading in for our full understanding, but it appears that she added to God's word here, that she wasn't even to touch it. Now, it could be, and here's where I am reading in, okay? But it could be that the serpent has, and I should have had, I should have picked up, let me run, it's going to be a lemon. I'm not picking on lemons, but that's what's happening in the kitchen, okay? Okay, I got an orange, just a little more round, <laughs> okay? And by the way, everybody who says it's an apple, really? How do you know? Did it say it was an apple tree? <laughs> it didn't, did it? It's just fruit. But the idea I want you to get is here's Satan upright, beautiful, 
because he's coming disguised. He's not coming, like I said, like the devil with the pitchforks and all that. He's coming beautiful. He's coming enticingly. And he's got a piece of fruit in his hand and he's saying, Really? You can't eat this fruit? Look at this fruit. He's appealing to her. And it could be because he's holding it out to her tempting her come on take it take it take it that that's why she said we're not even supposed to touch it we don't know what's going on but he's getting her to doubt and he's bringing in that confusion so so again am i telling you dogmatically that's how he did it i don't know i don't think i really care enough to know when i get home to heaven but if you do you can ask <laughs> i'm sorry to look at that sign i don't want to look at it long Okay, so she tells him not, we can't eat from it or touch it or we will die, okay? Um, it would seem here that she doesn't, and, and here it's hard because how could she really understand death? She hasn't seen it, she doesn't know it, but she's being told this is something, you know, that's not good for you. Remember, they only know the good side. Um, but it, it, it just, it could be that she's watering down what has been said. She's losing the focus of this is what God has said. Okay, and again, that's the subtle enemy of God today. He's going to sow doubt into the word of God. He's going to add to it, or he's going to water it down. He's going to revise its meaning. He's going to reject part of it. That's what's going on here. All of that, however, whatever angle fits in your mind, that's fine, because, again, we don't know exactly. Uh, Rowena, you have a question? She's unmuting. Who is it? Rowena. Oh, she's still unmuted. She's trying to unmute. Can you help? Try again. Try again. My question is, um, when did God give the command to Adam? Because the, that verse in Genesis 2 was before... Uh, Eve was uh, made out of Adam. There is the belief, and you're on it, that Adam instructed Eve what God had said. There's also the belief that we know God created Eve in the same day that he created Adam. So there isn't as much time spread there as one would think, and that God collectively is talking when he told Adam, he's telling them. Now, I'm not sure which side of the equation I want to fall on, but even if it came from Adam to Eve, she said that God said we're not to eat or even touch it. So whether she's adding in, whether Adam added in, she's putting it on God that this is what God has told us. So I can't really answer your question. You have any input on your end? Well, no, no, I just remember when we're memorizing Bible verses, we were taught to memorize it word perfect. And yes. uh, apparently Eve did not do that. Oh, yes, yes. Well, the, way, the way I see it also is that uh, the instructions uh, were given to, to um, Adam because uh, I guess Adam was the, the head of the woman so and, and and what the way i take it is that adam might have said to to um to eve you know god has said that we are not to touch we must not touch but to 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 eat out of the tree but i will say that if i were you i wouldn't even touch it <laughs> <laughs> she could have or she could have surmised that in her mind I tend to think because of the way that it's ordered in scripture, we do get the idea that God spoke it to Adam. Adam related to Eve. Remember, he is her head, not yes. to lord it over, and we don't have any of the fighting for that position because this is prior to sin. But he was, she was to complete him in his fulfilling what God gave him to do. So if yes. this is what God gave him to do, and she's going to help him fulfill it, I can see that God may have said it to Adam. Adam passed it on to Eve. Again, we're not really told, but I have no right. problem. I really have no problem on either side.
Go ahead, Anne. Oh, I was just going to mention that, that should that be the case, then that that's one reason why uh, there was such focus on Adam for having followed what Eve did. Well, we will get into that point. There is a difference between the deception and the actual outright sin. We will see how God refers to that in other places in Scripture. So that definitely will come into play, but regardless of whether God had spoken it to him or to them, Yes, Adam takes on, there's a heavier fault in him than there is in Eve, because Eve was deceived. Um, and, and we'll see that. We'll definitely see that. But God does make it very clear. We're not to add to the Word of God. Um, it, it sounds as if Eve's held responsible for it because this is who it's recorded under, um, which makes me think she's adding to it. But yet again... Um, who knows? Who knows the conversation that took place? You know, we really, we're guessing. But Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2 says, You shall not add to the word which I'm commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Now this is given to the children of Israel later, but we have the same God giving command to Adam and or Eve, and Eve being in Adam, if, you know, um, inclusively if if it wasn't Eve there also um, we can't excuse it from Eve how she phrased it whether she got that idea from her husband or from herself she's still adding to what God said even when Adam said to Eve if that's how it went she should have held to what God said if he added on, and I wouldn't even get near it if I were you, then that's the part she shouldn't have been focusing on. She should have been focusing on his words. In other words, as soon as you're opening it up to that, you're opening it up to, well, how far can I go? Okay, don't cross this line. Oh, can I put my toe right up to that line? Let me see if I can get away with putting my big toe over that line. But I didn't really go over the line because 99.9% .9 of me is on this side of the line. Where do we draw that line? You can see how this is what man does. A man reasons it. A man waters down his sin. You know, well, I didn't really do that sin because, and he finds a way to get around it. We're going to talk about that because of what happens too. But right now, um, we'll just leave it that we don't really know where the origination of the added words were. But since they're given here in Eve's mouth, we'll use them from her, and we'll see that we should not add in. That, you know, sometimes you would think adding in would be the right thing to do, but no. Just leave God's word. It is complete. It doesn't need adding. It doesn't need deleting. It needs to be left exactly as it is. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Every word of God is tested. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words or he will reprove you and you will be proved a liar. As soon as you open up to adding in, you open up to making a mistake. God forbid, because he will have to call that out. Yes, Dora? Could it be when it was translated somewhere along the line, somebody add something? Well, every word inspired, so it's not adding it in in a word, in a way that is not giving us the... The true. It's just not given us enough to know who did it come from. The the narrator didn't say to Adam and Eve if it wasn't Adam. How did he get that part of the idea? And if Adam's the one writing it down, which I think he didn't put in that part. So we're we're really left with the question. Till we get home to heaven, we really won't know whether he gave her that <coughs> idea or whether she got that idea on her own. I just don't think we can be conclusive. But my Bible doesn't say that. What does your Bible say? <clears throat> Let's see. It says, you shall not eat or touch it or you will die. And that's Eve's words. So we're going to take it, it's Eve. Okay? Because that's what, all we know is Eve said it. Yeah. Okay? And so at you? that point, on face value, we'd say Eve added that part in. Okay? Face value, that's where it's at. Take a deeper thing about it. You come up with proof of one way or another. We're open to listening to what you have to say, but I don't think you're going to get proof. I think you're going to get, hmm, I wonder. Okay? Revelation 2, 18 and 19 also says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. 
If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in the book. And if anyone takes away the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life, from the holy city which are written in this book. What I get from this and what I think we need to learn from this is God takes it very seriously. Don't put words in my mouth. I've given you these words. You live by these words. Don't take my words away, but don't add to them. What does every false religion do? Takes away God's word. Adds to God's word. The Book of Mormon is equal with the book of the Bible. The books of the Bible. You know, they're, they're put on an equal plane, and if anything, Book of Mormon is raised higher, studied more, looked at as more important than the words of the Bible. This is the warning we're getting. Don't add to God's word. Don't take away from God's word. Everything you need is there, is holy there. W-H-O-L-L-Y is true. Stick with what God says, okay? So, we have what, what really is now the first lie from Satan in verse 4. Whoops, I've got to get back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4. Eve has said her part to him, not to even touch it or you'll die. And the serpent says flat out, you surely will not die. Period. Lie. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> okay. How can I get it across? What is Satan? He's the father of all lies. He is a liar. He is called a liar. John 8, 44 tells us he's the father of lying. Let me show you how seriously God takes lying. Run back to me to Revelation. I should have told you to keep a finger there. Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse 8. This is how serious God takes the lie. You know, we talk about little white lies, and it's okay to lie. Mm. God says in verse 8 of Revelation 21, that for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters, did you hear anything good in there? I heard a pretty nasty, rotten list. And guess what comes next on the list? And all liars. Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know where liars end up? And I'll just flat out say it. They end up in hell forever. It is hell for them. God does not take this lightly or easily, and I think it behooves us to watch our words that we don't fall into those traps of thinking, well, let's mix a little bit of the truth with a little bit of a lie. The spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. No, this is not God. And if he wasn't that heavy on it, we could worry that some of his words weren't true, wholly true, and nothing but the truth. But this is what we have, the holy, true word of our living God and he is, Satan tries to be his opposite, cannot, but in this category, as much as God is truth, Satan is a liar. And he will pay for it in hell forever where he belongs. So, he sows doubt into Eve's mind. Once he sowed that doubt into her mind, then he substitutes his own words, his own words, you won't die. And he takes away the fear of judgment from God by doing that. You have nothing to fear. You're not going to die. You can eat this. That's what he's saying to her. He's pulling her into his web. He's the spider to the fly. You know, come into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. You know, and he's trapping her in. Go back to verse 5. We'll see our story develop. Okay, he's flat out told her, um, that she will not die, because verse 5 says, For God knows in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay? He's suggesting to her, as soon as he says God knows, he's suggesting to her that God's warning was merely because God feared she'd come up on his level. She'd know too much. She'd learn too much. He, in essence, is calling God a liar. I think that's why God takes this so heavily and why he's so disturbed by it. 
And if you've ever been lied against when you know that the, this is the truth, it upsets you, does it not? You want to be exonerated. You want that to come out. You don't want that lie left on the page. You don't want anyone to believe it. You don't want it there for future generations. Well, if we're feeling that, how much more is the God of all truth? And if he isn't all truth, I want no part of him. Because if I have to guess which part's right, which part's wrong, I'm going to throw it all out. How can I ever judge and know? But God who is all truth. She is being told, God's holding this back from you because you'll be like him. You'll learn too much. And, and God's lying to you. There's something good for you here. You will become like God. Okay, what does that mean? You will be like God. The word is Elohim in our Hebrew. You have to know from the context whether you're talking about little gods or the one true and living God of Israel. But this is the very same. Well, it's the sin that brought Lucifer down. It's the sin, sin that caused Satan to fall. What was that? He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be God. He wanted to be equal with God. He wanted to receive the worship of God. So the very thing that tripped him up, he is using to trip her up. He's appealing to, in her, you'll be like God. Wow. You think God's so great? You can, you'll be like him. That's what he doesn't want. You'll be like him. And entices her with that. So he's denying God's own word. He's denying, he's causing her to question God's goodness, his sovereign goodness. He's setting himself up. Again, he'd be equal with God, and he's telling her, you can be equal with God. And anything that tries to be equal with God, they're declaring themselves their own God. And we know that that is idolatry. We know that anything that we make out to be a God, whether it be ourselves or something that gets our attention that way, is explicitly in Scripture we are told, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Nothing can come up to God's level. We know that. He is the only perfect one. And so through all of this, she is, he's putting doubt on the character of God, and he's building her up to be equal to, to be a God. Isn't that what still trips up man all the way through to today? When man's full of him, himself and his pride, doesn't want to do things God's way, what is he saying? I'm a God. I have my own world. I'm little Caesar. I'm sitting on the throne. I'm going to do it the way I want it. How many people do you know who are not believers in God who want it to be by their own rules? You know, well, I'm a good person. I've lived a good life. Okay, by whose standard? Well, by mine, of course. I've done this. I say this. Oh, okay. Well, then, we'll just say, because we always use the name Johnny. Johnny, number one, says, here's, do this. Give money to, um, to um, you know, good needs. What do you call it? <laughs> oh, come on, Rochelle. I'm sorry. I'm really fighting for words today. <clears throat> good deeds of giving your money helping your neighbor. But then along comes this one. It says, well, hey, I did those good deeds, but I also did something else. So I'm better than your good. Now it's my good. That's my standard. Do you see where we'd be? We could never know. And if, if we even had that be the way we made ourselves to God, which is what the cults do, they're working their way to heaven, whoever gets to say that they've done enough? You know, you come along and, and you've given you know, a billion dollars, and you, you really, you ate the cheapest food you could, okay? You ate beans, okay? So that you could give your money to God, and you're feeling so good, and your life is coming to end, and you're looking at, wow, God's going to be so pleased with me. I've, I've given a million and one dollars to the Lord, and you're feeling good, and then mitzvah, thank you, good deeds, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Julie. <laughs> And then you've got someone who comes up and says, well, <laughs> I gave two million. <laughs> and on top of that, I did a few other things too. You know, it would be a disaster. God set the standard by himself. He is holy. He is pure. He is true. 
is his work and it's his way. And no one can equal that level. So he brings a way for us to come up to that level. We know through the shed blood. But this is all Satan is doing is trying to bring himself up to that level. I'm God, my way. And really, our cults, that's what they do. They call it New Age. Is it really new? I don't think so, because New Age is telling them, oh, you can all be gods, you can all be your own little gods. That's basically what it's saying. She's out there saying it, so I'm not picking on a person, but Shirley MacLaine, which you don't hear much from anymore, she took away the fear of death, because, oh, no worry, you'll just be reincarnated. You'll come back as something else. Don't worry about death, you get a whole new experience. And if you know, especially in the Indian false religions, Buddhism and that sort of thing, you have that. You may come back as a gnat if you live a bad life, but you can come back as one who is supreme and full of power if you've lived a good life. It's amazing you know, how they look at it. And I'm even appalled to know that they look at the cripples as that's their judgment because in a former life, they didn't live a good life. They didn't do well, and so they've come back this way. Stories told of a couple, a Christian couple, who adopted um, children. But when they adopted, they weren't believers in the Lord yet. They didn't know the difference themselves. And so knowing that their children came from a background of Buddhism, they found a Buddhist church, and they took the children to church, and they saw the children, one in particular who was crippled, was carried right down front and almost like put on display. And they thought, oh, how nice. You know, they're, they're including him and giving him a, a prime seat. What they were doing was they were telling their whole people, this will be you if you don't live the right type of life that you should be living. This one is paying the consequence of his former. And when they found out, when they got saved, and when they found out, they had a lot to undo and a lot to change. But see, Satan came in with light. He came in with false light. He came in with this false testimony. And how many people does he lie to today? How many people has he told, you're good enough? You're good enough? Why won't God let you into heaven? You've done it. Good deeds, mitzvot, all your life. This is his life. And he feeds that pride. You can be your own God. That's what he's doing here. So we really see he's causing them to deny who God is, deny the goodness of God, the sovereignty of God. He is telling them one little bit of truth. Because what do you do to get a lie across? You mix it. You're bringing a little bit of truth. So this part he was writing, you will know good and evil. That's true. But let me ask you, was that good? By sinning, Eve would know evil experientially, experimentally. She'd know it by her own experience is what I'm trying to say. She's only known good from God's hand. Now she's going to know that there is an evil side that she's never known. She's going to know it upfront and personal. Someone that gave this analogy, they said it's like telling a deaf person, you're going to be able to hear. Well, yes, the ears are open to hear, but all, it could, all those ears could hear was the screaming. How would you like that to be? No. In other words, yes, you're going to know evil, but you're not going to know it as anything good. It's going to be as horrible as if a deaf person's being told, you'll hear, yay, but all they're going to ever hear is screaming. It's, I hope you can catch the analogy, <laughs> but again, what I want you to see is Satan has thrown doubt on God's integrity, on his goodness. He has said God's depriving you of some advantage. Um, he's saying God doesn't love you the way God's saying. He's told you that he's keeping you from that out of love. No. That's not love. He's, he's, whether by reason, whether however he's doing it, he is sowing that doubt into what God has said. And anytime we start to reason things, we start to open to that, try to figure it out ourselves, think we can come up with a better way or a better understanding or a better insight or whatever, look out. Because if you're beginning to walk away from your faith, in God that says, God, I don't get it. 
I don't understand it. I don't understand how you never had a beginning. I don't understand how you could master plan this plan. But anytime you begin to question, come in, you are moving away from faith and you are in trouble. Faith, without faith it's impossible to please God. By our faith, we have that rope of righteousness. Our faith brings us into a relationship with our God. That's where we need to be. And Eve is not moving in faith in her God. She's starting to question. There's a doubt there now. And she's starting to reason. And especially if she is the one who added in those words, we can't even touch it. Because like I said, maybe he's going to just, just touch it. Um, I'm reminded suddenly of the story, um, A View from the Zoo. Gary Small wrote the book, and he worked for time in the zoo, and he uses the animals to tell us spiritual lessons that he learned during that time. And he was told with the snakes that there was a snake in a particular cage that had been shedding its skin, but it had not been able to shed all that. It was, it was stuck around, I think it was around the head part. So it was his job to go help get that skin off of that snake that it was supposed to um, have been able to shut on its own. So he went and he said the hard part wasn't in the beginning. They, they had to grab hold of the snake right behind its head, you know, and, and hold it there. There were two of them. You know, one would hold it and the other would pull the skin off. He said that wasn't the hard part. It's easy to step in, to start in, to sin. The hard part was letting go because when they let go they had to get away fast enough that the venom would not get them because the snake doesn't understand they're helping them and going to sit there and say oh thank you the snake's going to do what a snake's going to do it's going to shoot venom so he said that was a hard part and he saw that the lesson in that sin is very easy to grab hold of very hard to let go of and here's what i see so I'll say, tell us, don't even touch it, but not in the way you've said it. <laughs> but it just, um, well, we've got another failure. We've got man in their first dispensation when they have only to go by their innocence. They're going to fail. And here is where we see it. We see the step down. So I think I've probably said enough. And I don't want to belittle the point too much because we've got more to get into. But verse 6 tells us what happened from there. With the question in her mind, with the words being added, with all that's happening. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, hmm, it was a delight to the eyes. And the tree was desirable to make one wise all sounds good. Good to eat, good to look at, good to make you wise. She took from his fruit and she ate. And if your heart's sinking, good. You're beginning to know how God must have felt. And she gave to her husband, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Okay, let's go back and look at those different words she saw. She allowed her mind to be influenced. She allowed her emotions to be influenced by the suggestions of, of Satan to sow in that doubt, to sow in that pride. She continued to gaze at the forbidden tree. Okay? Now, if we don't resist temptation, resist temptation, what are we going to do? We're going to succumb to it. In other words, if an alcoholic has trouble with drinking, and he goes and says, well, I'm doing good today. I can go sit in the bar and just talk with my friends. I'm not going to drink. What's he doing sitting in the bar where it is? Eve should have left the area. She should have gotten away from the tree. If he's holding it out to her and trying to get her to touch it and take it, she should have turned her back on it and moved away. Any time that we are feeling a tug toward, if we don't take an action to move us against, we're going to keep continuing down, and unfortunately, usually the temptation wins out and gets the best of us. She saw it was good for food. Now, she's got all the other trees around her to eat. It's not that she's lacking. It's not that she's bored. It's not that she's needy. She just saw that it looked good. It appealed. It appealed to her physically. It appealed to her bodily appetite. As she gazed on it, it probably was becoming more and more attractive. I'll tell you, the, the closest I could get to this, 
when I'm trying to be good and stay away from chocolate, if I see it and I smell it and I can reach out and touch it, we had a Bible class in a friend's home. She put out sweets and things for people to eat at the end of the evening. I had come this one night absolutely determined I am not going to blow my diet. I am not eating tonight. And of all nights, she had a box of C's candy. <laughs> I'm going to stay strong. I'm going to resist. The box was in front of us. We all sat around the table. It was in front of us with its lid on. Just literally before my mom started teaching, she took the lid off. <laughs> I sat there for two hours smelling it. <laughs> and I'm sorry to say, by the end of the evening, my willpower was gone. <laughs> and I indulged. I see this for Eve. Roger just gave me chocolate. I don't want it. I see this for Eve. She didn't turn away from it. She's going to weaken. We've got to turn away from whatever is in our lives that's not right for us. We're going to weaken. This is called the lust of the flesh. Okay, the flesh wants it. Now, she saw it was a delight to her eyes. It was pleasant to the eyes. It appealed to her aesthetically, to her senses. This would go into her soul. This is like, ooh, this might be something good. And that's called the lust of the eyes. So we have the lust of the flesh, the bodily appetite, the lust of the eyes, the appeal from the eyes, and the desire, desirable to make one wise. That appealed to her mind and to her spirit. One's pride. In knowledge, I want to be like God. I want to have spiritual insight. I want to be more like Him. This is what was being tugged at with her, and that's called the pride of life. And if we look at any sin you can name, you can divide it into one of those three categories. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. I'll let you do that on your own time. Start thinking about any sin you want, and you will see it will fit in one of those three categories. I have a reason why I'm drawing you to that. Let me take you to 1 John 2, 15 to 17. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. 1 Yochanan, chapter 2. This is the little books in the back, almost toward the end, not the gospel that tells us of Yeshua Jesus' life here on the earth. Okay, and in 1 John 2, starting with verse 15, we are warned. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from this world. Okay, so we're given those three categories scripturally. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And again, how is Satan going to attack us? The same way he did Adam and Eve. He's going to appeal to one of those or more than one of those senses. Go just before um, Revelation, actually just before the, the Johns. Go to the book of James, the little book. Um, go to James chapter 3. Okay, in James chapter 3 and verse 15, we have here, This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. As soon as you're using your own reasoning and your own mind, you are earthly, it's natural, and it can even be demonic, because Satan was demonically what we would equal to that, because Satan's henchmen would call the demons, working on seeds, on Eve. That's the source of the temptation. Satan will work on us the same way. He'll work on us around us. He'll work on us within us. God works within us to do his will and his good pleasure. Satan's going to work in you to not do. So what happens to Eve? It looks good. It's appealed to her in all senses, always, to, from her eyes to her flesh to her um, pride, everything is there. So, of course, she gives in and she ate. We, we read that. She ate it. After questioning, after doubting, after the modification of God's word, Eve rejects God's word. And rather than being submissive, rather than being obedient to God, she becomes self-seeking. 
She wants this is can be good for her. She's self-centered. She's not thinking about anybody else. She's not even thinking about Adam. She didn't say, you know, let me talk this over with my mate. She's self-centered and she is self-willed. And we see this is the steps to sin. The forbidden fruit, whatever fruit it was, first step looked upon. Then it was desired. Then it was taken. Then it was eaten. And then it was shared. She gives her husband. She causes him to stumble, although he's responsible for himself, but it threw the whole human race into sin. This is the steps of sin. We see the will of God was rejected. Sadly, the will of God was rejected. The word of God, now let me put it this way, sorry, because I like this better. The will of God was resisted. She resisted his will. The word of God was rejected. Okay? The will of God resisted. The word of God rejected. The way of God deserted. Okay? Resisted, rejected, and deserted. Sadly. She gave to her husband. She gave it to him, just the sinners today. Uh, she felt impelled to lead Adam now to participate in the same sin. She probably used the same arguments. Look, this, this is good. I didn't die. I'm still alive. And, and it, it's good to know more, to be like God. She probably used those very same arguments if she had to do any convincing. We don't really know where he was at. But she, she does get him to go along. Um, all we know is 1 Timothy 2.14 tells us for the sake of time, you can look it up later, but that's where it tells us Eve was deceived, Adam was not. His was deliberate sin. And because of his sin, death is entered now into the whole human race. That's Romans 5, 12, and uh, 18. I'm going to read those for you, Romans 5, 12, and 18. Again, 1 Timothy 2.14 tells us Eve was deceived where Adam was not. But Romans 5 and verse 12 says, Therefore, just as though one man, I'm sorry, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. Verse 18, so then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through the Act, the one act of righteousness that resulted justification of life to all men. What we're seeing there is we are being told by one man sin entered into the whole human race. By one man, the one we call second Adam, justification can come to the whole human race. One man brought it to all. The second one brings the remedy, the redemption, the salvation to all. But Adam willingly chose to share her sin, to share her guilt. Did he do it because he loved her and he just wanted to go along with the one he loved? We don't know. Again, we have to read into the story to know. But how thankful we are that when Adam and Eve failed, and they both failed in this test, Yeshua Jesus succeeds. When he was tested, when he was tried, when Satan came after him, he did not succumb. When we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we come to verse 45, and in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, we read, So also as it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Adam's going to bring death. The second Adam is going to bring life, the life-giving spirit that can conquer death. So when the way was lost for us, Yeshua Jesus regained it for us. Now let me show you how he, in his human form, did not succumb to, to the same temptation that we see Eve and Adam both did also to mankind. Go with me, and this is probably where we'll close for today. Go with me to Matthew chapter 4, and this may be familiar territory, but in case for those of you who it's not, I'm going into it in detail. Matthew chapter 4, we're going to start with verse 3. This is a time when Satan came to tempt Yeshua Jesus. He's gone into the wilderness. He's going to be alone there with his God. 
He's going to be gone um, there. He fasted in verse 2, 40 days and 40 nights, and then he became hungry. That doesn't mean that you don't become hungry for 40 days and 40 nights, but literally um, physicians will say that the steps of starvation are coming into play by the 40th day. The body's really breaking down. So this is a hunger and a death. If you don't eat, you're going to die. This is uh, the weakest point the body's at physically from the lack of food at this time. This is when Satan came to him. And Satan is going to tempt him along those three lines. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We read that as we read through this quickly. The tempter came and said to him, If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. He's starving, okay? He's on that edge, humanly speaking. His human body was starving. So Satan goes after him. Well, turn the stones into bread. Then you can eat. What's your problem? You don't have to go into town and go find a kitchen and cook some food or bake some bread. You can just turn the stones into bread and you can eat them. He is appealing to Yeshua's bodily senses, the physical appetite that he needed at that time to eat. That's the lust of his flesh, the, body, the bodily appetites. Then he appeal, appeals because the Lord doesn't do that. The Lord says to him, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Yeshua had greater food than that earthly food. But then he appeals to the lust of his eyes, verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they'll bear you on the yeah, on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Okay? The lust of the eyes, um, here we have um, am I getting it backwards? Sorry, let me make sure I'm on track. Um, okay, let me read it through and then I'll break it down for you because otherwise I'm going to mess my mind up. Okay, so there was your second test. Um, Yeshua, Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to test. <clears throat> Third time, again, the devil took him to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Yeshua said to him, go, Satan. That's the be gone and keep on going. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, the angels came and began to minister to him. Okay, so the lust of the flesh, turn the stones into bread and eat them. The lust of the eyes, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Now remember, Satan is the prince of this world. He's the power of the air right now. That's why he could offer the kingdoms because he did gain back the dominion over earth from Adam. Adam gave it up. And Satan, in this sin we're talking about, had control of the earth now to be able to offer the human side. So he's appealing to the emotional desires, the, the soul, the nature of that pride is being appealed to in the lust of the eyes. You know, you'll, all of this can be yours. You don't have to get it by way of the cross. I'll just give it to you. And then the pride of his very life that cast yourself down. Your angels will, will save you. That's appealing to his spiritual pride. He could get worldwide recognition of the highest. He would, have, he would be seen as the highest intellectually. He would be seen as the spiritual eminence under the, the special protection of the hand of the holy angels because he's the very son of God. So you'll show the whole world who you are because the angels wouldn't save anybody, but they will save you because you're God. So he's appealing to his eyes, to his, his flesh, to... To, yeah, to the less of the eyes, the less of the flesh, and to the pride of life. All three times Yeshua answered the same way. I emphasized it, but I don't know if you caught it. All three times he says, it is written. It is written. It is written. And he uses the scriptures, the word of God, without adding to them and without taking away. He uses them to answer Satan, and he wins the victory over him. He doesn't succumb to the temptation, he quotes the word of God in its purity, and he is victorious. By us believing in and standing on God's word, we too can be victorious over Satan. So where I said earlier, when he knocks on your door, send Yeshua Jesus to answer, 
But if you are in an entanglement with him, he didn't knock on the door, he wasn't polite, but he burst right into your world. The best way to answer him is to answer him via the word of God. Hide the word of God in your heart that you might not sin against God. If you have the word of God, you have what will shore you up and enable you to come out victorious because it's the word of God that brings victory. It's not our strength. It's not our power. It's not something we're going to muster up within ourselves. It is the very word of God. If you should, Jesus chose to answer with the word of God. He could have made Satan toast. He could have made the stones bread. He could have done anything, but he chose to answer him by the word of God. That's a template for us. We want to be able to say, no, Satan, it is written and then quote the scripture that's going to help you be strong against that temptation, that step. Remember the church of Laodicea thought they were so good, they didn't know the word of God. They were weak, they were impure, they didn't have the word of God. That's where we need to be. And then the consequences will be different than what we see here. I'm going to pause here for two reasons. One, I'm looking at the clock, but two, for the last couple of minutes, my screen has been 100% frozen. Do we have an audience, Roger? I don't have anything here. So I thought they were moving lost. a little bit. But... No, they're not moving at all. <clears throat> I wondered. I was on the spiel. Dora was with me, <laughs> and I, I don't know if the our phone should be lighting up, but... Yeah. Um, I, got a totally I think we've lost. For some reason. Yeah, I think we've lost. Do we need to come no, back to in? Shut it down, restart, basically. Okay, go ahead itself. and do it, and we'll just tie it up for today, and I'll pick it back up here next week. I don't feel like I did a great job anyway. I've <laughs> done this once before for a while back, but I never could figure out what it's doing. I feel like, it's like it goes to sleep, and there's no sleep function. I turn them all off. Keep going. Yeah. Hmm. You see a black screen up there? Sorry. Now when they when they quit moving for that long, I figure I've lost my audience. But uh, <coughs> did I make sense, Dora? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no signal. Yeah. I just wish you would tell how much time there was, you know, between. between yeah. I'm very curious. <laughs> I'm very curious. Was it long? Was it short? Yeah. Did everything happen fast? They didn't have much time to to learn nothing. Yeah, we know that there was enough time because I'm going to be bringing out later. We know that they walked with God in the cool of the evening. But so there had to have been, walk. yeah, there had to have been more than one. Mm -hmm. But you could say, well, they had a couple evenings. Maybe they had a week. Maybe they had a month. Maybe they had a year. We don't know. We don't know. I kind of feel in my own mind, Satan would come pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. He wasn't going to give them long. You know, he wasn't going to give them time to strengthen themselves in their God. He's going to want to get in right away and get back. Almost like I would feel on the basketball court when I was on a team. If I lost the ball for, you know, the, the enemy, the opposers got it, I had to do everything in my power to get that ball back for our team because, you know, I was the fault and I wanted to redeem, you know, and I almost feel like that would be his attitude. I'm not going to give them time. I'm going to go snatch it. But yeah, I am curious. And where was Adam when this was happening? Everybody asks that. Was he nearby? Was he far away? You can't say he was sinning by leaving her on his own because sin hadn't entered in yet. But why aren't they together? What happened? Was that normal? Or was that a moment of weakness? You know, because everything's prior to sin is weakness because of sin. If so, then it wasn't a moment of weakness. You know, it, it's... There's a lot to think about. And believe me, I've been working on this more than a week. You know, I've been working. But actually, you can't blame them too much because they had no reference to anything. Right, right. They just simply should have stayed obedient. That's it. The same way we really expect out of our little ones. Mm -hmm. You know, we just expect them. You know, you don't need to understand why. <laughs> you know, you just need to do what we say. They're all waiting and discussing the lesson. <laughs> so they're still so they're all on and we're off. Yeah. <laughs> is God truth. telling me, shut your mouth, zip your lips? <laughs> <laughs> I was texting uh, Rowena to let her know what happened. Rowena's a good, she's always been. Even when yeah. we were in the Philippines, she was my connection. 
That's why when she got nervous about us getting home, I got nervous about us getting but, home. Yeah, it's good to know that if the computer shuts down, they're still going. They're so. still going. And I hope somebody's taken lead there. Yeah. <laughs> and we get to join. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Hallelujah! Just remember, you can't raise grown kids. They're going to do what they want. Oh, my God. Yeah. We're still there we go. Shalom! Shalom. <laughs> I've been multitasking here at the house. So I'm getting ready to leave, get on that freeway again. Yeah. Well, so whoever, on the freeway. whoever took uh, so over. Back for show stuff. <laughs> there they are. Oh, she got them. Oh, We're I'm here. Probably. We're <laughs> here. Good lesson. Good lesson. I hope so. I don't feel like I was being real clear. I did ask Dora because Dora stayed live with me. <laughs> she got the completion of the temptation of Yeshua. Obviously, we'll pick that back up next time. We'll review that and what it means and how it relates to us. She said I was communicating. So hopefully I did well. Hopefully you all took over and <laughs> continued with you know the thoughts that were there uh, my apologies I saw you all freeze I had to finish my thought but as I'm finishing my thought I'm thinking they're not moving they're not moving and finally you know I, I said Roger it, it's been too long they're not moving that's when we yeah. discovered that we were disconnected but we had no idea you were still all connected we thought everybody was down and then I guess Roger Rowena went back and we forth. Were than you were. <laughs> you were what? <laughs> I'm going to be more gross than you were. Oh. Uh, I'm going to go. I'll see you tomorrow at 8.30 in the morning. Yes. Yes. Right. Shalom, Dosi. Shalom. 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 Go get your grandkids. Yes. We just continued to discuss what you were teaching, so it was not really wasted. We Thank knew the you Lord. were coming back. Thank the Lord. And yes, I'll always try to find my way back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I, I saw you on it. She's so frozen, but I don't hear her. <laughs> <laughs> and see... I'm moving. I'm not frozen, but you all, I told you, I shouldn't have said it. I said I'd be the frozen chosen today. <laughs> and really, my nose and my fingers and my toes are. <laughs> so but I also said, apparently the Lord said, Rochelle, zip your lip. You've said enough. <laughs> so um, are there any questions or comments you all have had, but anything you want to say or share before we close in prayer? And my apologies. We will pray for a better connection. Uh, but all of these are lessons to us. The communication line's broken with God. Wow, can you imagine from before to after? And Dora and I were talking, you know, how long were they in the garden before this episode took place? Because, like I said, they talked with God in the evening, the cool of the evening, so we know there was more <coughs> than a day. But did they one have day, a yeah. few days? Did they have a week? Did they have a month? Did they have a year? You know? We don't know, but uh, any comments, questions, anything to tie up, or should we just close the room? Oh, no no. no. oh, there was no black clock, no calendar yet. <laughs> True, but they That's knew right. evening and morning. They knew evening yeah. and morning, and they knew evening and morning. Yeah. They didn't know January 1st, or if I put yeah. it into Hebrew terms, Nisan. You know, no, they didn't yeah. have names of months and days, I don't believe yet, although very soon they do because we see that in keeping the Shabbat and that sort of thing. They, You know, it, it's being formed. But I'm not going to say that, that Adam was peeling off the calendar page to, to, <laughs> or checking an X through it. Julie, yes. Well, they had a map of enough time in their relationship that he knew she wanted to be like God. So okay. there had to be some time, to, time there. Right, right, right. Yeah, many, many thought questions as we go through this, you know, that we can't really answer. You know, where, where the age-old question you hear that many think of is, why wasn't Adam at Eve's side? Was that normal? Was that abnormal? Was it a moment that Satan took advantage of? Was it a usual time? We don't know these things. The same way we don't know who will put the words in, don't touch it. But great thought questions. One day we can ask. <laughs> well, doesn't she actually Adam she gave to her husband with her? 
Yes. And he was there. Yes. Yeah. Some people read that in and say, well, then he was right at her side while it happened. I don't think so. I don't think that's what it means because I mm -hmm. think you'd have the interaction of him also. And it sounds very one-sided. But they do draw that from those words with her. But it could simply mean when she was with him, she offered it to him. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, we yeah. can't draw it out. You know? Well, yeah, he was he was with her in the garden. <laughs> yes, that much we do know. And I really doubt seriously that he was way over here and she was way over there. <laughs> I mean, he could have been walking with God, talking with God, and she went off. And yeah. Yeah. They yeah. talked in the evening. It sounds like God came in at an appointed time and he talked with them. So I'm not going to say Adam was off with God, talking with God, and Eve was left out and there she went. But I'm not going to, that's my personal opinion. Right. Yeah. And the Lord, uh, in, in, in the last verse in Matthew 4, He modeled for us what we should do when we are tempted. So back to the Word. Did, did I tell, did I teach that, Dora? Mm -hmm. that, that He modeled, the Lord modeled how we should, and that is, it is written. It is written, is written. And yes, that's what I encourage us, and that's where I'll pick that back up because I don't want to lose that point. If we try to answer or deal with it in our own strength, we will lose. But if we go to the Word of God, there's our power, there's our strength, there's our answer. And why it's so important to memorize God's Word so you have it in your mind and in your heart. So you can say to Satan, it is written. And if you know nothing else right now until you can shore yourself up in Bible memorization, I've given you one very easy one to remember today. When Yeshua told Satan, be gone. And because that's written in our New Testament, our Greek gives more um, tenses. English is only past, present, future. Greek is six. It literally says, be gone and keep on going. I like that. And that's what you can tell Satan when he is tempting you if you don't know another scripture to counter what he is lying to you about, just tell him, be gone and keep on going. But do it in the name of Yeshua, Jesus. There's your, right. there's your power. And you know, it, you know, also, when we, um, we move our focus from God, you know, because even though she wanted to be like God, but then she moved, even though that was uh, her focus, or their focus was God, but then she moved into uh, the, 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 the word of the, of, uh, or, or the, the words of Satan. We, we have to really be connected constantly with, with God. Because yes. if, if we don't, we will be in trouble. Right, right, right. We are weak. <clears throat> Our flesh is weak. Uh, even mm -hmm. Paul said, and Paul's a giant in my book, even he said, the spirit's willing. The flesh mm -hmm. is weak. It's the flesh that gets us in trouble. And how do we connect is in that spirit with the Lord so that we can conquer our flesh. But yes, yeah. I'm sure you all were able to finish the lesson well. <laughs> and I appreciate that. Um, wish I could have been there to hear too. You might want to pray out and then I can shut the camera down. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, let one. me ask Julie a question, comment first. Uh, it was a, about a uh, teaching that I've heard before, so if you want to go ahead and pray, then we can talk about it. Okay, we'll come right to you right after, but the Roger will quit the recording then. We're going to have to put some sort of disclaimer up on the website that the end of class will pick it back up in our next lesson. No, I just, I just cut it down. Yeah, but it's okay. got to end somehow, and it's going to end in the middle of that, yeah. you know, that um, the, those scriptures. But we'll figure that out. That's your, you'll, you'll do fine. You do very well. I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job. I'm just saying, obviously, we need to pick it back up. So next week, we'll start with the temptation of Yeshua, how he answered. And when, when you hear our repetitiveness, know two things. One, we're doing it for the sake of the video. But number two, repeating is how we learn. That's what really helps solidify it. You hear something, you hear it again, you hear it again, you hear it again. It begins to click. For some of us who are a little more dense than others, we need that three, four, five, six times. Y'all might be smarter than me. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for loving us, loving us even in our sin nature, being willing to redeem us from that. Oh, Lord God, how thankful we are for that. 
And yes, Lord, we do want to be strong in you, in your spirit, and in your word that we can resist the temptation. So we can resist the trickery. We can resist the deceit and the lies that come from Satan. Lord, we thank you that one day he will never be an enemy to us again. He will never be able to influence. He will never bring his, his havoc onto this earth. But as he is the prince of the power of the air now, Lord, thank you that you are higher and greater, and through you we can have victory. We can soar through into the heavenly spaces that are yours above the temptations and have victory. Lord, may, may we stay close. May we stay close to you, draw our strength from you, have your word hidden in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Thank you, Lord. We praise you in your holy name because you are worthy of our praise and it is you who does it all. Thank you. You'll only look for availability and then you give us the ability. Oh, hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we can close it off. We'll pick it up and do a, a little review and we'll move forward. We've got a little more to say about the eyes being opened. It, hopefully it'll be interesting. Um, Julie, I said I'd go right back to you.